So Bismillah, continuing on what an Islamic society would look like. Yesterday I talked about how a Khalifa would be chosen. Today I want to talk about how the court systems would be. And this is a very difficult topic, but inshallah I'm going to try to explain in, in the time that we have my best to try to explain how the Islamic court system is. But before I come to the Islamic side of the court system, let me talk about the court systems we have in the West so that we have something to compare with so we understand, oh, an Islamic court system looks like this. So in the Western system, in America, for example, you have the federal courts, you have the county courts, you have the high court, you have the supreme court. What does that mean? That means that when you start your career, you're in the district court. And you're doing family law or you're doing criminal law. And as you get better and better, and as you become more refined in your career, in your knowledge of the, of the legalities of things, you move from the lower courts to the high court. And then if you're really, really good, then you get to be where Imam Ghazali was at the Supreme Court. So everyone, it, so there's a, let's say a country, a civilization, and there are many court systems. And they have, so we have, now what will happen? Somebody has a marriage problem, he goes to the masjid, and the qadi sits in the masjid. The qadi what? Sits in the masjid. And the bid qadi will sit in the jamiul masjid where the Friday prayers are held. Because when the Friday prayers are held, all the other masjids are closed. That's how it was. And so everyone goes there. So if you have a big issue, you're going to go to the big masjid, the Jami masjid, where the Friday prayers are. But if it's a normal issue, for example, the issue is to write a business contract, or the issue is I have a divorce issue, you can say those issues that are easy issues, or those that are regular issues, or those issues that are, you know, adi, that everyone's used to these issues happening. So those you go to the masjid and you say, where's the uh, qadi? Oh, he's the qadi. But sometimes you have, you need specialization. Maybe there's litigation or maybe there's a big, you can say some harm has been done, which we call, you know, suing, and, but not in the Islamic, in the Islamic sense. It's very different. But let's say that somebody has been caused harm. You go and you find a specialist in the masjid, right? Now there are two situations. One situation is where the majority of the people follow a certain mazhab. For example, in, in Indo-Pak, majority of the people, they follow which mazhab? Hanafi. And in Indonesia, Malaysia, they follow which mazhab? Shafri. So, and then the third possibility is where there's mix. There's some Shafi, there's some Hanafis. So there'll be some masjids that are built upon the Hanafi court system. Some masjids that where people go pray according to the Shafi'i. And like this, you're, if you're Shafi, you go to the Shafi'i masjid for your issues. Okay? And you're Hanafi, you go to the Hanafi masjid for your issues. Okay? And uh, then what happens? The masjid has the Qadis, you go to the Qadi. Okay, now let me come to the Islamic part. No, before that, let me explain this. There is something in, in the court system or in legalities called formalism. What is formalism? You go to the DMV, what are they going to ask you some for papers? What's your ID? What's your address? Give me your state ID. Give me your passport. Give me your... Right? There are certain documents they need to give you your... What? License? That's... It's fixed. It's what? Fixed, something fixed that cannot be changed is known as formalism. It's formality. Right? This is known in Sharia, known as taqlid. Known as what? Taqlid means what? Formality. Formality. This is just how it is. Right? This is just an example of taqlid. Now, uh, so, you go to the DMV, they have 
uh, you need this paper, you need this paper, you go to the IRS, you need this paper, you need this paper, you need this paper. Same thing, you go to the court system. Some things are very basic. Do you have this paperwork? Okay, we accept this testimony, we don't accept this testimony. We accept text messages, we don't accept pictures. Everything is very what? But what happens? Let me go further. In Islamic law, the court systems that exist would exist today are of five levels. Of how many levels? The bottom levels are formal, formalism. They follow the rules that are already there, right? Because the marriage issues, they have had so many, everything becomes formal. And then as the court goes from the lower courts to the Supreme Court, there's more discretion. We call it what? There's a little bit, as the cases get hard, obviously, as any case gets harder, there's going to be more what? Discretion. Okay? There's going to be more of what we call realism. Now, even in the West, do you think all the lawyers look at, for example, the Constitution? They all look at the Constitution the same? Or are there different ways of looking at the Constitution? Tell me. There is something called constitutionalism. That's one way of looking at the Constitution. There is something called originalism. That's a different way of looking at the Constitution. There is something called realism. That is another, the document is the same, but people are looking at it from what? Different what? I'll give you an example. The U.S. Constitution does not have any clause for the U.S. Army. The U.S. Constitution has only a clause for a militia. Yes? There's no clause in the U.S. Constitution for the army, is there? But a person who is of the opinion of what we call realism, he's going to be pragmatic and look at the social systems around him and say, well, other countries have armies, so even though it's not in our Constitution, we should, instead of having a militia, we should also have a standing army that's paid and ready to go. Even though the U.S. Constitution, what? Doesn't say so. That is one way of looking at law. Another example is the U.S. Constitution never prohibited slavery. It just said you cannot buy and sell a slave. It said what? They prohibited what? Buying and selling a slave. They never said it's prohibited to have a slave. They're still there in the U.S. Constitution, by the way. So, some people will look at that, and they have a certain way of looking at it, based upon realism, for example, and they will say, well, that really means the intent of writing that was there would no longer be what? Slaves, even though it's not in the Constitution. So even though the document is one, but we have at least 10 different ways to look at the document. Originalism, for example, the Founding Fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, what did they mean? That these are inalienable rights and all mankind is equal before God. What did they mean? Did they include slaves in that? Right? Did they include slaves in that? So, what was the original intent? The other is what we call... I forget the terminology, it's called open textual. As long as it fits the wordings, as long as what? It means something according to the wordings, it's okay. So you have the constitution, but you have different ways of what? Looking at it. That's why you have constitutional lawyers. Now what is our constitution? What is the constitution of you and me, the Qur'an, the Sunnah of the Prophet, is that not our constitution? Yes? Okay. Then, is that enough? Is the text alone going to tell us something or are we going to interpret what it is telling us? Tell me. You have to, is, is the text talking to me or I am putting my mind on the text and understanding what it is saying to me? Tell me. 
I am using my aql. So um, now those people who knew the Sahaba, those people who knew the closest people to the companions, they looking at their attitude, their their ethics, their attitude, their perspective of looking at the text, they came up with a system. They came up with what? A system that this is how they looked at it. This is how the people of Medina were looking at the text. Right? They're not asking China how you're looking at Quran. They're looking at the people of Medina. And so they're looking at the people of Kufa, where Ali radiallahu anhu was. How are they looking at Quran and Sunnah? And so these people, they came up with methodologies to look at the text. And they have different ways of interpreting the text. I'll give you one example. One very simple example. In the Hanafi Mazhab, you have Fard, Wajib, Sunnah. Yes? I'm just talking about the top levels, not the bottom levels. Then Sunnah Mu'akkadah and so on and so forth. But you have Fard and then what? Wajib. Imam Shafi says, no, 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 I don't like these categories. He only has two categories. What are the two categories Imam Shafi has? Anyone knows? He doesn't use the word fard. He uses the word wajib. There's only wajib in sunnah. Something you have to do and something that's extra to do. That's it. Why do you want to create all these other categories? According to his view, which he also got from the early generation. But Imam Abu Hanifa said, no, there's fard, something you absolutely 100% have to do. Then there's wajib, something that is absolutely necessary for you to do. And then there is sunnah mu'akidah, something the Prophet did all the time, sallallahu alayhi wa So do they have a different method? This is one example, right? You can give hundreds and thousands of examples of difference of opinions of how they looked at the text. But now how does this relate to the court system of the khilafah? In the Sharia, or in, in, not Sharia, in Fiqh, there are seven categories of, you can say, administrators of courts, or judges. The first, the highest two can no longer be the case because that has to do with the founders. It has to do with what? The founders. But the lowest one is, for example, someone became a mufti. Now when somebody becomes a mufti, what does it mean? What does it mean when somebody becomes a mufti? He gets to be what? He gets to be a jurist, a lawyer. That's what it means to be a mufti. He's going to give you the verdict. Your inheritance laws, this is the laws, this is how, and this is a contract is correct, or this amount is correct. This business decision, this business is allowed in Islam. You can't have S corporation in Islam. You can't have this in Islam. So he will, the mufti will tell you what, is the, so the mufti who is following the mazhab as it was taught to him is the lowest what? Level. Is there's no, he's not dealing with complexities. And he's dealing with the lower courts. He's in every masjid. He's the one who gives you the appointment. Okay, come and see me half an hour before the hook. Okay, come and see me half an hour after the hook. Or come and see me half an hour before asr. You know, he's working. Where is he working? He's sitting in the masjid. He has a room like this, like Sheikh Tamer has. He takes the clients in there and he uh, writes the contract or does the nikah or does the issues, whatever he has to do. He gives it right there in the masjid. And so the lowest one is the one who is simply following the rules as he was what? Taught. The level above that are the fuqaha that have tamayiz. Are those scholars who within a mazhab who know that the statements, because every mazhab has many statements. Almost all of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa have different statements against one another. Qadi Abu Yusuf has one statement, uh, Muhammad Shaykh has another statement, uh, as, as Imam Zumar has another statement. And they sometimes agree, sometimes they disagree. So the different opinions within the fiqh, within the mazhab, who is going to weigh which opinion is heavier versus not heavy? That's the what? Huh? Second level. 
Okay? When do you need a scholar like that? You need a scholar like that when you're running into like, mm, I'm not too sure. This is now getting above formalism. This is not a normal case, right? So I have to go to somebody who kind of like understands which, uh, which opinion within the mazhab deals with this and has a strong opinion on this. Then there are scholars above that. They're called, uh, they have tarjih fil mazhab. They know that such and such opinions are really strong and such and such opinions are weak, but this weak opinion is used in these situations and this strong situa statement is used in these situations. For example, I'm giving an example. Then the next one on top of that is tarjih, uh, sorry, uh, takhrij. They're actually able to, within the mazhab, able to weigh the evidences. This is why you'll find, by the way, the ulama that are Hanafi in the Indopa, they have, they have different preferences within the mazhab. Then the ulama that are Hanafi in the Arab world. Like if you go to the ulama that are Hanafi in Syria, they have sometimes different fatwas than the ulama that are Hanafi in Indian subcontinent. Because even a mazhab doesn't mean you're following Abu Hanif or Imam Shafi or Imam Malik. It means you're following their principles. It means what? You're following their principles. You're either like constitutionalist or you're originalist or you're positivist or you're realist like they have with the constitution. Different ways of looking at the text. So as you go to the, the people that are, okay, so sometimes somebody is specialized in a certain aspect of Sharia and he's the expert of that. Like let's say business transactions. So within a mazhab, he is what? He's mujtahid fil masail. He is mujtahid in that mas'ala, those issues that are he's specialized in. So if it's a very big business case and it's very complicated and a lot of issues involved, they might take it to a specialist. But he won't be in every masjid. You know, that's going to have to do with maybe higher court or upper courts. So you have to go to a special place, a bigger masjid or some other masjid where this person is, wherever he's doing his job from. So then you have, you have the, so, so this is basically the five levels, right? So you have the lower court, and if you don't like what the lower court says, or you disagree with the lower court, or if they, the people within the government have a problem, then the issue goes from the lower court to, it can go to the high court. Then it can go to the supreme court. And whatever the court decides, that's the law of the land. You can disagree with it all you want. I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a Supreme Court of Islam. Like, there's a Supreme Court in America. Now, does the Supreme Court make decisions we don't like? Like, for example, the Supreme Court may decide abortion is allowed. Christians, they like this or dislike this? They dislike it, but it's the law of the land. Right? So, the same way, but... Of course, in Sharia, the rule is the law has to be with the Sharia. So there's no question of going against the Sharia. But I'm just giving an example. Let's say if the Sharia court decided an opinion, you don't like it. Still the law of the land. But the Sharia will decide those things that are public law that have to do with the public. They're not going to tell you, you can't pray like this, or you can't give zakat like this, or anything that's private law, they're not going to interfere in. Islam has never interfered in private law. You can be lahiri or you can be whatever or have mazhab or have no mazhab. It, it, the Islamic State doesn't force people in one direction or the other when it comes to these things. But that's how the court system works. Now, the judges, they all know each other. They meet in the masajid. They have their shura meetings. They make their decisions. The Supreme Court meetings happen in the masjid. The high court meetings happen in the masjid and they make their, their, their unanimous decisions or whatever decisions after deliberation, they make it in the khilafah, right? So the lower courts are like every, like we have Buffalo, so we have four or five, every masjid is like a court place. People can go there. And then you have the state level, one big or two big masjids where all the Jummah khutbahs are held, right? And if they disagree, they meet each other and they make decisions. And then there's the Supreme Court, which is for, let's say, the whole country, right? So all the big judges, they meet each other 
on, let's say, Zoom or phone, or they physically meet each other, and they make decisions, okay, this will be the law of the land according to the Sharia. So this is how it, would, it has worked in the past. This is how it has worked in the past. And this is most likely how it's going to work in the future. So what is it that I wanted to accomplish? I wanted to accomplish two things. Number one, as we move closer to the last shower, what do I mean by the last shower? The Prophet said the example of this ummah is like the rain, right? And so as we approach the end of this ummah, and we know what will happen at the end of this ummah, the revival of the Khilafah, the revival of the Islamic society. So it is important to start discussing what this will look like, this dream, of what an Islam would look like. That You know, we've only seen the Western model work. And it's important to begin to imagine and to dream and to redream and to recreate in our minds, oh, this is what an Islamic society would look like. I would just walk into the masjid and find my body, tell him my situation, and he'll give me an appointment. Then I will come with my wife, and then he'll decide, what, or with my business partner, and then he'll decide. And if I don't like his opinion, then I'll go to the bigger masjid that has the high court and challenge the opinion of this local masjid, like this. And one very important thing, is that in the Islamic court system, the, the, the legal system, this is why if anybody ever read the first chapter of Imam Ghazali's Ahya Muddin, which is the chapter of what? Knowledge. And in this chapter, he takes out the boxing gloves. You know the boxing gloves? He takes out the boxing gloves and who does he knock down over and over again? Do you know? Imam Ghazali in his first chapter, he takes out his boxing gloves and he knocks down, he does a knockout of the ulama. Okay, why does he do a knockout of the ulama? Because he's saying, you're, you think this uh, legalities that you're lost in, this is, this is the whole of Islam or this is the essence of Islam, I'll knock you down. Okay, this, so he punches people and says, this is not the real thing. I mean, this is, this is I, I have to take that word back. It is the real thing, but it is not the spirit, right? It's not the spirit. And so that's what he felt that people have become so legal-minded. Oh, your miswak is as, it should be this big. It's not a miswak unless it's this big. This is the actual example he gives, right, of the miswak. Oh, your miswak is not really a miswak unless it reaches this size. Or your, so you get what I'm saying, okay? So, uh, I hope this now gives you an idea of how the court... So we talked yesterday about how a khalifa would be chosen and what it has to do with the masjids. And today we talked about the court systems and how it has to do with the masjids. Right? And so one day, maybe, there will be issues, legal issues, and people will be coming to the masjid to solve them instead of going to some other place to solve them. And trust me, the hassle and the headache of divorce and marriage that we have with these court systems will be so smooth if you do it in the masjid with the Islamic rules. So smooth. We would save all these non-Muslims so much money. We would save them so much headache. And then all that happens is men begin to hate women and women begin to hate them. You've seen this, right? Because of divorces, how much hate there is. Islam would make it just very easy. These are the rules are set. Everyone agrees on the rules because it's your belief system. And then you decide, okay, this is owed to this person. It's not a matter of who's right and right and wrong. Okay, this is owed to this person. This is owed to this person. We care about every. We want to be fair to everybody. And there you go. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to uh, imbue that spirit. Ameen. Allahumma ameen.